In the following presentation, we will expose to you independent verifiable evidence proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the 9-11 attack was a state-sponsored, false flag black operation involving a carefully planned and skillfully executed deception at the Pentagon. Relying on detailed interviews with eyewitnesses to the event, the flight path of the jet that allegedly struck the Pentagon and was seen flying treetop level over Arlington that day is conclusively established. As you will see, this flight path is very different from what the government reports, and we will explain the significance of this discrepancy momentarily. But first we'll go over what initially made people suspicious of this event. Unlike the attack on the World Trade Center, the attack on the Pentagon was not broadcast on live television. In fact, within the first hours of the attack, the FBI had confiscated video footage from dozens of locations, the vast majority of which has never been released. All of the images that the public does have were taken in the aftermath of the event. These available images left many puzzled as to how the damage could have been caused by the impact of a Boeing 757. There was a distinct lack of visible airplane debris on the lawn in front of the building, and very little reported inside. Although a relatively few amount of scraps and plane parts were photographed, none have been positively identified as belonging to Flight 77 or tail number N644AA, and there were no photographs of large fuselage sections, wings, or recognizable pieces of the tail, as is usually the case after a plane crash. Additionally, Although this image of the damage after the roof collapsed is typically what is used by the media, the pre-collapse damage of the building seemed incompatible with the dimensions of a 757. Windows were still intact where the vertical stabilizer would have hit. Although these windows were considered blast-proof, it's not reasonable to suggest that they would be 757-proof. Oddly, just beneath these windows, right in the center of the hole, Column 14AA on the second floor remained intact. The columns in the area where the right wing and engine would have entered appeared to have been blown up and out, as opposed to having been pushed in, as would be expected if a plane had impacted. The damage is primarily at ground level, indicating that the massive Boeing would have had to have slid on its belly into the bottom floor of the building with the huge RB211 engines digging into the concrete and yet there is a conspicuous lack of damage to the foundation in all of the aftermath photos. The following plane crash examples show how damage and charring is to be expected. Yet none of these images from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, taken by photographer Jocelyn Augustino on September 21, 2001, a mere 10 days after the event, show any signs of damage to the foundation at all. The lack of visible foundation damage is underscored by an important scientifically validated fact that also fatally contradicts what we have been told. Using the reported speed and other values from the 2006 released NTSB alleged black box data, Pilots for 9-11 Truth has calculated the g-forces required for a 757 to descend to the level of the light poles and pull up to enter the building low and level as required by the physical damage and found it to be aeronautically impossible. This is the case if we simply consider the obstacles and decline in topography in relation to the official flight path, but it gets much worse if we factor in the NTSB reported altitude of 699 feet above sea level. So the physics of flight mathematically proved the official story impossible. All calculations demonstrated with scale animations are available in the presentation 9-11 Attack on the Pentagon by Pilots for 9-11 Truth. These dubious facts concerning the physical evidence and the physics of the event, added with a deliberate lack of transparency by the authorities when it came to the evidence in general, led many to doubt the official account of what transpired that day. Numerous alternative theories were put forth, but they were mostly speculative. In 2006, Citizen Investigation Team launched an independent investigation into the event. 
who traveled to Arlington, Virginia to speak with eyewitnesses who were on the scene that day, especially individuals who had a good view of the final seconds of the plane in flight before it allegedly impacted the building. The purpose of this expedition was to establish the true flight path during this critical period, as reported by the independent eyewitnesses on the scene, in order to compare this information with the physical damage as established by photographs, video, and official reports. In tandem with the inception of this independent investigation, the government has responded to this effort with the quiet release of significant official data sets. Most notably, flight data recorder information allegedly from the black box of Flight 77 as released by the National Transportation Safety Board in 2006, and the alleged radar data released by the 84th Radar Evaluation Squadron in 2007. The NTSB data definitively establishes the officially required flight path of the attack jet, and the 84 RAIDS data establishes where all of the planes in the airspace near the time of the attack had to be according to the officials in control of this data. However, the true flight path as reported by the independent eyewitnesses definitively contradicts this government-controlled and supplied evidence, proving it has been manipulated as part of a very deliberate deception and cover-up. The very notion that the government would manipulate their own data is alarming enough. However, there would be a second implication that is much more disturbing, yet equally unavoidable. That implication is this. If the plane did not fly where the physical damage and the government-supplied data says it did in the final seconds before the explosion at the Pentagon, it did not hit the building. Naturally, this would explain why the physical damage has been considered so questionable and anomalous. In the final seconds before the alleged impact, a plane on the officially required flight path would have flown south of Columbia Pike, south of the Navy Annex, and south of the former Sitco gas station at all times. As it turned out, the eyewitnesses reported the complete opposite, proving the plane did not hit the building and that the physical damage had to have been staged. Thirteen eyewitnesses from the five most critical vantage points unanimously confirmed the plane crossed to the north side of Columbia Pike, flew directly over the Navy Annex, and north of the former Sitco gas station irrefutably contradicting all official reports, release data, and all physical damage alleged to have been caused by the plane. First, we'll present the required south side approach, as indicated by all official reports, data, and the physical damage. Number 1. The 9-11 Commission the following is a time-lapse depiction of the flight path of American 77. south of the Navy Annex, and south of the former Sitco. Number 2. The alleged black box data released from the National Transportation Safety Board in 2006. Scale animations created by FAA certified pilot and founder of Pilots for 9-11 Truth, Robert Balsamo, based off heading provided by the NTSB. The NTSB says it flew south of Columbia Pike, just south of the communications antenna on the Virginia Department of Transportation's property, south of the former Sitco gas station, and directly over the Route 27 overpass bridge to hit the light poles and enter the building entirely on the bottom floor. Take special note of the location of the bridge and the depicted trajectory of the plane. But don't forget, Although the Southern Approach heading reported by the NTSB does match with what was reported by the 9-11 Commission, the final altitude reported was 699 feet above sea level, making the final descent and pull up to hit the light poles and be low in level as shown in the Department of Defense 2006 release security video, physically impossible. Number 3. 
the physical damage starting with the down light poles as depicted by defense contractor integrated consultants and officially endorsed on the State Department website usinfo.state.gov. The plane has to fly directly over the bridge in this exact trajectory in order to hit the light poles. Light pole 1 on the south edge of the bridge allegedly speared the windshield of Lloyd England's taxi cab. Light pole 2 on the north edge of the bridge was hidden on a steep hill in the bushes completely unnoticeable to passing motorists. Light pole 3 was off to the side in the median of a cloverleaf exit ramp. Light pole 4 was concealed on a decline with a guardrail in front of it. Light pole 5 was also concealed on a decline. So the exact location of the light poles is only acknowledged by corporate proxy, as they have failed to address this in any official report. In fact, the Virginia Department of Transportation is in control of light pole maintenance, and when asked via Freedom of Information Act requests, they denied having any documentation as to the exact location of the poles that were allegedly downed on 9-11 and later replaced. The reason the exact location of the downed light poles and taxi cab is so important is because it establishes the required location and trajectory of the plane down to the foot. Even a minor deviation in approach would have left one or some of the light poles untouched and resulted in a different damage pattern. Despite a clear effort by the officials to not report on the light poles and keep the specific details ambiguous, their exact location has been independently established by the photographic evidence, as just demonstrated by defense contractor integrated consultants and further demonstrated by this image taken before the attacks in May of 2000, showing pole numbers 1 and 2 intact on either side of the bridge. In this image from 9-11, both poles are downed. These two poles on the bridge in particular are the most important of the five because they were the furthest south, making it physically impossible for them to be downed by any type of aircraft at all approaching from the north side of the gas station, as reported by all the known witnesses in this critical area. Number 4. The Officially Commissioned Building Performance Report by the American Society of Civil Engineers They published the following images depicting a southern approach angle of the plane. But the true purpose of this report was to document the damage to the building. They covered each and every damaged column and depicted the overall damage as being directional exclusively requiring the depicted southern approach angle of the plane as referenced in all official data and reports and published in these images. Note the definitive trajectory of the damage to the building depicted. Starting with the anomalous alleged impact into the outer facade of the building's E-ring, ending with the curious, almost perfectly round, alleged exit hole in the C-ring. The ASCE also established the required low and level impact into the bottom floor of the building. They reported on page 28, quote, The aircraft seems for the most part to have slipped between the first floor slab, on grade, and the second floor. Note how they depict more than half of the left engine burrowing into the foundation that photographic evidence shows was left undamaged. Yet they didn't depict or report any foundation damage. The required low and level first floor impact was also depicted in a project published by Purdue University. Note how they avoided the problem caused by the low hanging engines of the plane by simply not including them in the animation at all. The plane absolutely has to be south of the Navy Annex, south of the gas station, and directly over the Route 27 overpass bridge to hit the light poles and cause the low and level directional damage to the building as documented and reported. 
there is no room for error in the official flight path at all, so these critical details should have been easily confirmed by the witnesses. But as you are about to see for yourself, they independently and unanimously reported the opposite, proving the plane could not have caused the physical damage. Virtually all of the following first-hand witness accounts were video recorded on location, and they have been categorized into five separate and opposing vantage points. Many of these same witnesses were officially recorded by the Center for Military History or the Library of Congress only weeks after the event, placing the plane in the same location. This eliminates the notion that their accounts are inaccurate from faded memory due to the amount of time between the event and their recorded independent interviews a few years later. The independent interviews in this presentation have been edited for conciseness, but the complete interviews, as well as the transcripts and recordings of all referenced official interviews, are available to view for free at citizeninvestigationteam.com. Vantage point number one, from the south side of the Navy Annex. Edward Paik, auto mechanic, independent interview recorded November 4th, 2006. It almost hit these roofs over here. Yeah. So when we saw it fly, it was coming from... Coming from, from like this way. Mm -hmm. Coming from there to mm -hmm. this way. Okay. And then at the time feeling it looks like it almost hit my roof, that much roof. Kind of the uh, body side, the, the, over the building, and the wing is at this way. Oh, oh, so you're saying the body was over the building? Yeah, the little over here. The body is a stand over body here. Okay. Body's there, okay. The wing, wing is the right wing. That's, that's the direction. All of Ed's illustrations have the entire plane crossing to the north side of Columbia Pike, headed directly over the Navy Annex. All animations of witness vantage points were created by Pilots for 9-11 Truth for their presentation, 9-11 Attack on the Pentagon, and are based off a hypothetical average of all witness illustrations reported. This is a reconstruction of what Ed describes. Note how the aircraft continues directly over the Navy Annex, as illustrated by Edward. If the aircraft were on the south path, as required by the physical damage and official data, this is what Ed would have seen from his position. Ed does not describe anything as such, and has the entire plane on the north side of Columbia Pike, and directly over the Navy Annex, where it was picked up by the next witness, who is an aviator, adding professional credibility to his account. Terry Morin, Program Manager for Sparta, Inc. at the Navy Annex. Independent interview recorded June 8, 2008. The bottom line is, mm -hmm. I was an aviator. I know what an airplane is. I, I can tell you one thing. Uh -huh. uh, there was one of the conspiracy articles you know, had. It was about 737s. And, and, uh -huh. and I will admit that I made a mistake on ID in the airplane. And the reason is, is because it flew right over the top of me. It's not like... Right over the top of you. Now, were you between the wings of the Navy Annex or out of the... I was right at the edge of being on the outer portion, okay? So... Mm -hmm. And when the plane went right over the top of me, I was within 10 feet of the edge. I was inside, mm -hmm. flew over the top of me, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and which is like it's right on the edge and I'm right here, mm -hmm. okay. I then, because I'd already heard about, nine, you know, the, the Twin Towers, oh, sure. immediately ran to the outside. Mm -hmm. And that's when I watched the airplane and I moved you know, into a position where I could see it. Right. If the Air Force Memorial had been built, the airplane would have ran into it. Mm, okay, yeah. That's, okay. that's the long lines with where everyone else who talked to saw the plane. Now, how long of a period of time are we talking? Oh, God. What? 13, 18 seconds? 13, 18 seconds, that much? Well, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean he was flying 350, 400 knots. I say 13 seconds uh, as an aviator flying 500 knots. He wasn't flying 500 knots. He oh, it wasn't? Oh, no, no, no. He was 350. Mm. Something like that. 
the relatively slow speed as described by this professionally qualified witness does not match the 460 knots as reported by the NTSB. Let me ask you this. What are the chances that the plane was actually on the south side of Columbia Pike completely, or on the south side of the V dot? No frippin' way. No frippin' way. No frippin' way. He was right over the top of me. You're 100 percent certain that it was over the top of the Navy Annex. I am. Up. He is on the edge of the Naval Annex. The, the plane itself would be on the north side of Columbia Pike at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is Columbia Pike. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a fence right here. Right. I'm inside the fence. Yeah. Okay. But he went right over the top. So you're saying the entire plane then, including the right wing? Is the right wing hanging a little bit? I mean, there's only how much? How no, I'm saying over to the north side of Columbia Pike. Maybe it's hanging over the Navy Annex, but there's no way it was the plane itself or even the right wing was on the nope. south side of Columbia Pike. Nope. Vantage point number two from the former Sitco gas station. Robert Tercios, station employee. Independent interview recorded November 5th, 2006. We normally get flybys from the airplanes, but it was louder than that. So, you know, I started looking where he was coming from. So, you know, just looking around and I saw uh, in the airplane come down here over the tree. Okay, let's see. Let's see where you say it was coming down. We're, we're on the south side of Sitco Station. Robert says he saw it come down over here on the north side. Is that right, Robert? That's correct. I thought he was going to uh, hit the, floor, the street here, the ramp. But, uh, you know, so I ran out here to this mound to see, you know, see if I could see what was going to happen. Uh, he was so, you know, kind of quick, maybe two seconds when I saw just uh, swoop down here. And, uh, you know, I tried to follow it. And I saw it uh, lift up a little bit, and I saw it uh, lift up a little bit to get over to the, to the side of the bridge here. To the side of the bridge? Yes, where you see the, the do not enter sign. Simply. Right there. So it flew up to go over that? Yes. It, uh, okay. I, my view was, you know, I could not totally see when it hit the Pentagon. All I see is, uh, all I saw was it headed straight to it, and uh, then the big uh, explosion, just a fireball and lots of smoke. Okay. Did you see it? Actually, so you didn't see it hit the Pentagon. No, the view is just not as it was obstructed. Still, I could only see the the fireball did from the explosion. See, did you see it uh, hit any light poles? No, I, I may have missed that. I just saw it pick up. I just saw it pick up. The plane cannot pick up at this point. In order to hit the building low and level as required by the physical damage and depicted in the security video. Just to make, you know. You saw it pick up to miss that, yeah. rather than hit any leg post. This is exactly where you saw the plane fly fly by, right? Yes. As I said before, it seemed to me it seemed like it was going to crash onto the the street here, but it but it did. Uh, I saw it lift, take a go up a little bit, lift, take a go up a little bit, headed towards the Pentagon. As far as how it came over this corner. Was it more like the wing or or the body? Was it the left wing, the right wing, or the the actual body? Oh no, it was plane? more like the right wing headed. So, I gave you this piece of paper yesterday to draw a flight path on that. That's your drawing, correct? Yes, well, that's correct. This is the drawing you made of the flight path. The official story says that the plane came on the south side of the Sitco and hit the light poles and then went on to the Pentagon. Um, Robert, how certain are you that the plane came on the north side of the station as opposed to the south side? I am 100% um, sure that it, what I saw is the plane come out from this corner of the canopy 
over this side of the camp. Robert describes the plane on a path that is irreconcilable with the physical damage, but corroborates what was reported by Edward Paik and Terry Marin. He describes it as being on the north side of his place of employment, the former Sitco gas station, and actually pulling up over the highway. As demonstrated earlier, all physical damage and government data require the plane to approach on the south side. Here's what the plane on the official south side flight path would look like from Robert's point of view. As you can see, this puts him on the complete opposite side of the plane from what he described and illustrated. As an employee who works there every day, this would be a wildly drastic mistake for him to make. But Robert's general placement of the plane on the north side has been proven to be factually accurate with corroboration from all other known witnesses at the station that day. Officer Chadwick Brooks, Pentagon Police. Library of Congress interview recorded November 25, 2001. Independent interview recorded November 7, 2006. What side of the station did you see the plane fly over? Okay, actually from the front of the station. From the front of the station, exactly where we were at earlier, where the yellow uh, Jersey barrier. Okay, was it more on the, uh, when we're facing the station, more on the north side or to the left? No, it was more to the left. More to the left, okay. And was the plane, the entire plane to the left of the station, or maybe portion of it over the, um, the canopy of the station? No, it was more towards the left. It was, the entire plane was to the right. left station, the wing and everything. Right. During okay. this point right here, we uh -huh. were able to see everything. We were able to see everything. Right. When that plane came to see across here. Okay, so it came, it came from up over here. Right. Like where the trees were at? Yeah. Uh huh. It, and it was descending. Correct. It was descending, but then it had already been descending. Okay, it was so basically doing a, a straight line. It was a straight line that was depending on it. Sure. And it was actually in route, and it was a straight line. This is an approximate reconstruction of the event when considering Brooks's statements and observations of the plane on the north side. Here is what it would have looked like for him with the plane on the official southern approach. Once again, this would place him on the complete opposite side of the aircraft from his crucial perspective, a ridiculous and virtually impossible mistake for anyone to make, let alone a federal officer who is professionally trained to observe and report. Of course, all the other witnesses in this area prove that he was not mistaken about this simple detail. Officer William Legassi, Pentagon Police. Library of Congress interview recorded December 4, 2001. Independent interview recorded November 7, 2006. Where did you see the plane coming from exactly? What direction? Did you see it approaching? Well, I saw it, like I said, from the If you look here where Arlington Cemetery is, uh -huh. right about where those transformers are, yeah. that's the first place I saw it. it. Cleared all these lampposts, or cleared all the light posts. So it was heading towards you, coming from Arlington Cemetery over there? No, 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 no. No. It was heading from left to right. It came from FOB2 area. So you're saying it was uh, it came from to the north side of the Navy annex even? Yes. Okay. Now what it did what it did before, what I'm saying what it did before uh -huh. those transformers, mm -hmm. I don't know, because that's the first place I really saw it was right mm -hmm. there. But it was not coming towards me. It was coming from left to right or from east or from west to east. That, that stone fence that we just zoomed in on over there is, is the fence to the Arlington National Cemetery. Yes. And as far as you could tell, um, the fuselage was over that. Yeah, that's, I mean, best guess, estimate, that's about where the fuselage was. And how high was it at that time? About 100, 150 feet AGO. All right, now, how sure are you that the plane was to the north, coming from the north side of the Navy Annex? You're saying it was pretty much between the Navy Annex and Arlington Cemetery? Yeah. How right certain on. are you of that? 100%. Bet my life on it. 100%. Bet my life on it. Okay, I forgot to get you to draw draw the, where you saw the flight path coming, what Sergeant Legassi. I'm out of here. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that. make that nice and thick for me. Okay, Sergeant Brooks is going to draw for me on the image. Where he saw the plane fly. Yeah, about this bit crazy, so like, okay, bit absolutely. He's looking. He's going over here to the north side from where he remembers it flying.
All right, make that nice and thick for me. You want it thicker there? Yeah, sure. I think that's pretty close. That's that's damn near perfect for what I saw. And we've never, yeah, we've for the never, record, for the we record, we've never, never talked to each other about this at all. So you guys, neither of you guys have even really talked about this never, with never, each other. Never, never, never talked. Never, in all these five years, and you both independently drew the flight path line pretty much exact. I know, I was, I, I, the way this has been going, you know, I was, who knew what he was going to put down there because he was in a different location with the nose, but it's right there, which makes me feel good about the way I remembered it. So you're both pretty much 100% certain that that's, that's what you remember the flight path from. different locations, yes. Now let me ask you this. This is going to sound kind of silly. What are the odds that both of you are mistaken as far as the fact that the plane was on this side of the station and that the plane actually came from the south side of the station? Uh, I tell you right now, <laughs> it, you can't say more than 100% because there's no way it was anywhere other than where I said it was. What about you? Again, something like that, something of, of that magnitude. So to reverse that question, what's the percentage chance that the plane was actually on the south side of the station? Uh, zero chance. Is there less than zero <laughs> percent? It would be impossible for me to have seen through the building, over the roof, to see the plane. Officer Legassi bets his life that he saw the aircraft pass to the north of him. Some have argued that Legassi may have been mistaken due to the length of time between September 11th and his interview filmed on location. However, Legassi was interviewed via email by researcher Dick Eastman on June 24, 2003, when he said he was on the starboard side of the craft as it passed the station. The starboard side is the right side of the aircraft. The only way Legassi could have been on the starboard side is if the aircraft was on the north path, as corroborated by Officer Brooks and station employee Robert Tercios. Legassi emphasizes the fact that the aircraft couldn't have been on the south path because the gas station itself would have been blocking his field of view, making it impossible for him to see. So it would be impossible for me to have seen through the building, over the roof, to see the plane. This is what a plane on the south path would have looked like from his location. It's just not feasible to suggest he could have been so wildly and drastically mistaken, and the notion that all of the witnesses at the station are so wildly mistaken in the exact same way is not even remotely conceivable. There's no way the plane was over here. If anything, the only indisputable fact is the angle was different, that it was closer this way. Mm -hmm. But it had to be on the side. It had to be on the north side. It, there's no way it was on the south side. I can't see. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. It should be noted that there is not a single witness on the station's property or anywhere in the near vicinity who contradicts them. Yet there are several more on record who corroborate them perfectly but who were also in a position to see what the plane was doing as it approached, putting them in the perfect place to reveal more specific details about this crucial moment in the flight path. Vantage point number three, from the north side of the Navy Annex. William Middleton, Sr., Arlington Cemetery employee. Center for Military History official interview NEIT 427 recorded December 12, 2001. Independent interview recorded June 6, 2008. Right up there he came in between, what's that, the Hilton and Navy Annex and he started dropping. It was coming, I don't know the name of this street here, but it leads to Henderson Hall. You're talking about the street right here on, on the north side of the on Navy the Annex? On the north side of the Navy Annex. It was coming straight down the middle of the street and I wonder what was going on. And as it come past me, it was dropping. Okay. And you could... Now, were, you were right here at this time? I was right here, okay. right there where that truck is. Okay. And when he came past me, uh -huh. my sweep was a three-wheeler. I could feel the heat. Oh. That's from, how close it was to me. From the plane itself? From the plane itself. And as it went down, you could see that he was kind of fighting with it. Then you hear when he kick, I don't know, a full throttle. So, so draw the way you, you saw the plane come. From right up there, he came in between, what's that, the Hilton and the Navy Annex. And I seen him, if this is it, yeah, I would say. 
Okay. So. Well, this is our parking lot right here. Yeah. And That's so the they came right over the parking lot. This is exactly where Officer Legassi placed the plane from the opposite perspective. About how many seconds do you think you saw the plane for? About 10. Yeah, about 10 to 15 seconds before impact. Oh, okay, so it was kind of slow. It was slow, yeah. I say 13 seconds uh, as an aviator flying 500 knots. He wasn't flying 500 knots. William corroborates Terry Marin's account of a speed much slower than officially reported. Since they were both about the same distance away from the Pentagon by the Navy Annex, they were both in a very good position to judge timing. But, okay, now you said wobbling. Wobbling, right. Like, you know, I guess by his descending, he was okay. straightening. Yeah, trying to Positioning, turn. right. Positioning. Turn for position, right. Trying to get into position, huh? Right, because where they hit at, they hit right at the, it used to be the heliport. Yeah. But they moved all that. They went right to the, that, it was a tower, a little tower that they went right for the tower. William Middleton is a very important witness because if the aircraft was on the southern approach, as required by the physical damage and official data, he would not have been able to see it until after it passed the Navy Annex, if at all. William's view of the aircraft on the official approach would have been completely blocked by the large Navy Annex building on top of a significant topographical incline. The only way William Middleton could have seen this aircraft is if it was on a north path, as described by all the witnesses at the gas station, fatally conflicting with the government story. Vantage point number four, from the Arlington Cemetery maintenance buildings. Daryl Stafford, Arlington Cemetery employee. Center for Military History official interview, NEIT 420, recorded December 13, 2001. Independent interview recorded June 6, 2008. I looked up, looking in this direction, and I could see the plane over the corner of that, uh, the building there. What building? The uh, that would be the Naval Annex. Navy Annex? Yeah. Now, it, did it look like it was directly over the Navy Annex, or um, was it farther to the left of it, or what, what would you say? From what I've seen, it was to the right of it. To the it right? Was, it was on this corner of it. Oh, on the, on the right corner? Yeah. And what those corners, you can see the building in the background, which is the Sheraton right. up there. It looked like it came over that, and then it looked like it was just over top of the neighborhood annex uh, on the right corner of it. On the right corner? Yep. Okay. From right up there, he came in between, what's that, the Hilton, the Navy annex. And we were kind of stunned and knew we wanted to get out the way or something. It was headed, it appeared that it was coming right for us, actually. So we knew we wanted to get out of the way, but... You mean kinda, it was headed right towards the buildings, like? It, it, uh, yeah, if it came off that end, it looked like it was just coming straight in this direction. Oh, okay. It was on the AVA Annex. It was flat. It was just like it was on top of the roof, landing on the roof. It just like it barely made it over the roof. Uh -huh. And then when it got beyond that point and we started to scatter, it started to bank to the right, still okay. coming forward. Okay. The officially required low and level southern approach flight path is perfectly straight and absolutely cannot be in a bank for the plane to have hit the light poles and building, particularly at the officially reported speed of 460 knots. This very important detail is repeated by multiple witnesses. Okay, kind of off of this corner. Uh -huh. And down here. Okay. Darius Prather, Arlington Cemetery employee. Center for Military History official interview, NEIT 422, recorded December 13, 2001. Independent interview recorded June 6, 2008. As I looked over, I noticed the um, airplane, nice sized plane was coming in and it was like, it may have been about no more than three feet above the Navy annex when it was coming across from there. It was looking like it was coming over here for the buildings where we are over here. Okay, so that's it was where right it was on facing. top of the Navy It was annex. on top of the Navy annex. And it looked like it was headed towards... It looked like it was headed towards this cemetery. way. It appeared that it was coming right for us, actually. It says this was coming across from across the building. It that's was the about, Navy annex, right? This is the Navy annex. Uh -huh. 
And as it was coming across, uh -huh. it dropped down a little bit. Towards you. But angled. Okay. As it was dropping down yeah. more. Yeah. And then it started angling. Once again, take notice to the detail with which this right bank is described. A significant bank in this manner is irreconcilable with the NTSB data, Pentagon security video, and all physical damage. As it was angling, you see where the, um, where the uh, street sign is in the middle of the street. It's like gray from this side, but it shows you like directions how to hit 95 or the Pentagon. Oh, yeah, the overpass see that overpass yeah, sign? Right, yeah. So as it was coming across that area, uh -huh. it was on in between from where the gas station is, but uh -huh. more over this way more. Uh -huh. In between from where the gas station is, but uh -huh. more over this way more. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. As I felt it came along in this area, uh -huh. and then it started to go more this way. So it's banking. Yes. And as it looked from there, like it's heading here, but then it started to back in. And part of the wing of that was like over in this area. But mm -hmm. this was the direction that came straight through that little road along there. Mm -hmm. And it started pivoting up. Donald Carter, Arlington Cemetery employee. Independent interview recorded June 6, 2008. So at the time, you know, all of a sudden we seen a plane far as over the overhead, over the um, naval annex, coming from over. So actually, you know, we spotted him, then he, the, the plane actually veered off, sort of like he swerved off, and then he caught, you know, got got on track. Wobbling, right? Like, you know, I guess by his descending, he was straightening. Would you say it was more on on the north side of the gas station over here or the south side on it the far more, other end? It was more on this side. On the north side? Right on this side. Okay. More on this side. On the north side? Right on this side. Okay. Just the overhead of the neighbor. He, he sort of come over. And you guys were right over here? Yeah, we was right over here. He sort of came over came like this center and then he kind of veered over and then he went on around like that. Our biggest thing here is trying to figure out exactly where that plane flew. Right. And you guys got a really good look at it being right here. Yes. I yeah, mean, I was looking. Man. So, I mean, some people say that it was it was far over on the other side of, of the sicko. No. What do you have to say about that? Well, they must didn't see it. This is a hypothetical reconstruction of their statements animated from their point of view. Coming from on top of the Navy Annex in their direction, and then banking right headed towards the Pentagon. Unlike the witnesses at the gas station, the witnesses at Arlington Cemetery had a clear view of the plane approaching from the Navy Annex and were able to give detailed descriptions of the significant right bank. This relatively slow right bank is an extremely important detail because the officially required southern approach flight path is perfectly straight and cannot have banked right at all at this point. The Arlington National Cemetery workers do not describe a perfectly straight southern approach as seen here and required by the physical damage and official data. Although all of these witnesses believe that the aircraft hit the building, their unanimously corroborated placement of the plane is in direct contradiction with the required south side approach. All of these witnesses work in the area every day and as mentioned, many of them are on record with the Center for Military History placing the plane in the same place only weeks after the event. Yet some have argued that they are all mistaken or even lying regarding this, but are accurate regarding the alleged impact of the plane, which was much further away and obscured by trees. Furthermore, these witnesses described how they were running away from the scene for their lives and were therefore not paying attention to what the plane did after it passed them which explains why they believed it hit the building and did not see it flying away. Nobody was really trying to look to see if it actually was going to hit the building or not hit the building. So everybody was running in the opposite direction for their lives. Vantage point number five from the Pentagon heliport tower. Sean Boger, heliport air traffic controller. Center for Military History official interview NEIT 299, recorded November 14, 2001. 
independent interview recorded November 1st, 2007. And, um, I just had to be looking out the window. And as I was looking out the window, I could just feel a plane. And exactly, exactly like three minutes later, so the plane was coming directly at us. And uh, when I saw it, you know, I was just in amazement. So I just, then I just looked at it and he, you know, I fell to the ground and I covered my head. Let me ask you, how, how long or how many seconds would you say that you saw the plane for? Before we hit? Yeah. Uh, maybe about, maybe like, uh, I'd say between 8 and, eight and 15 seconds. 10 to 15 seconds before impact. Oh, okay, so it was kind of slow. It was slow, yeah. I say 13 seconds. Uh, as an aviator flying 500 knots, he wasn't flying 500 knots. The NTSB reported the plane's speed at this point at 460 knots, which equals 530 miles per hour, or 781 feet per second. At that airspeed, it would only take a mere 3.4 seconds to travel from the Navy Annex to the Pentagon, in direct contrast to the approximately 10 seconds reported by aviation professionals Sean Boger and Terry Marin, as well as by William Middleton all who were in strategic positions to be able to tell this detail with accuracy. Where in relation to the Navy Annex what was the plane? Did he come uh, when to I saw the airplane, he was, uh, he was practically in front of the Navy Annex. Okay. And so he was, coming, he was coming like at an angle, you know, his, his uh, wings were tilted, so it was almost like he was in a, like, trying to bank towards the, uh, towards the uh, Pentagon building. So you would say he was kind of almost turning towards the Pentagon? Yeah. Okay. Once again, the significant right bank is corroborated by a key witness, even though this important detail is a fatal anomaly when compared to the official data and physical evidence. You could, you could see the gas station from there, correct, the Sitco? Yes. Okay. Would you say, which side of the gas station would you say the plane was on as it approached? Would you say it was on the left? As you're looking at the gas station, would it be more to the right, like the Arlington Cemetery side? Or would it have been on my right in the gas station left. If I'm looking out the window, I'm looking towards the gas station. It'll be on my right hand side. If I'm looking out the window, I'm looking towards the gas station. It'll be on my right hand side. Okay. So and if you and if you were at the gas station with your at like at the back of the store, with your back to the store facing the Pentagon, it would have been to the left of right. the gas station. Right. Okay. So it was closer to Arlington Cemetery rather than the highway Route twenty um, uh, twenty seven, right? Yeah. Okay. That that's yeah. That's exactly what we've been hearing from. So that yeah. It 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 would essentially would have had to have come over the Navy annex. Essentially, was it over the? Would you have guessed the middle of the Navy annex or more to the to your right or more to your left? I would say more to the right. Also. Now describe the the tilt that you were talking about as it came or the the turn or as it as it was tilting. I guess to the bank, if you will, or whatever. Can you describe it to me at all in in any way? I was just saying like as like as he was coming towards me. It just seemed like he was tilting the aircraft to his right. It started to bank to the right. Okay. It was almost like, not really going in nose first, it's just like, almost like at an angle, like a right angle. Okay. So he, so he almost like he was off course and he was turning to straighten out. Right. Like all other witnesses in this critical area with the most relevant vantage points, Sean describes the plane as approaching from the Navy Annex and banking to the right as it passed on the north side of the gas station. Sean is an aviation professional whose job was to watch aircraft for a living, making him an extremely credible witness, particularly from his privileged vantage point in the heliport tower right next to the alleged impact. Although he reported the plane hit the building, his corroborated placement of the plane on the north side proves that it could not have and he does mention that he hit the deck and covered his head, as would be the natural reaction for anyone watching a plane head directly towards them. From five critical and opposing vantage points, 13 eyewitnesses independently and unanimously confirm a north side approach, fatal to all official data, reports, and the physical damage. All of these witnesses have worked in the area for many years and are extremely familiar with the topography and landmarks. Some have been officially documented reporting the same thing only weeks after the event, and others are aviation professionals and police officers, who are therefore expert witnesses. Absolutely none of the independent witnesses willing to go on record have supported a south side approach. None of these witnesses were aware of the implications of where they saw the plane when they were interviewed. 
Since the release of their interviews in the public domain, all have been made aware of the implications, yet stand by their stories as reported, and none have claimed their accounts have been misrepresented. Most could not see the alleged impact point due to the complex topography and landscape and admit to running, dropping, or flinching for cover, explaining why they did not see the plane flying away. But their independent and unanimous placement of the plane on the north side amounts to proof beyond a reasonable doubt that it did fly away without hitting the building. Although the witnesses presented so far did not see the plane flying away, we know that some did. Pentagon police officer Roosevelt Roberts Jr. saw the plane flying away immediately after the explosion. He was at the Pentagon South parking lot loading dock only a few steps inside the building during the explosion, but immediately ran outside and saw the plane flying away. He officially testified to this in a recorded interview for the Library of Congress on November 30th, 2001, only weeks after the event. And then my sergeant, Sergeant Woolrich, Woody, he called and he said, Hey, Rob, listen, we're going to Threcon Delta. As I hang up the phone, the plane hit the building. It all came at the same time. Watching the TV, it was like it was almost time for preciseness. So... Uh, as I hung up the phone and I ran to the center of the dock and I looked up and I saw another plane flying around the south parking lot. It's about like 9, 12, 9, 11 in the morning. And then uh, there was dust and stuff coming from the ceilings and you could hear people screaming. So what I did was I turned around and I drew out my weapon. I didn't know what was going on. I thought we was being invaded. I didn't know what was happening. Although Roosevelt was incorrect about the time and assumes what he saw was, quote, another plane flying away from the Pentagon immediately after the explosion, neither witnesses nor official records support two planes near the Pentagon at the time of the attack. Roosevelt describes witnessing a commercial jet immediately after the explosion almost as low as the light poles, and we directly confirmed these critical details with him over the phone in May of 2008. Let me let me just ask you a couple of quick questions. Was, there, there was mainly a, a couple of specific things. When you you had mentioned uh, right as you hung up the phone, you you ran outside. Which, which parking lot? Which dock were you at? I was in South Parking, and I was at the East Building Dock when I ran outside and saw the low flying aircraft above the parking lot. Okay, was it a was it a, a jet or was it a? Do you remember what kind of plane it was? It looked like to me at that time uh, a, a large uh, aircraft liner. Like a. It wasn't a. It wasn't a jet. It was a commercial aircraft. Okay. Did it have propellers or did it have jet engines? It looked like jet engines at that time. Jet engines. Okay. Um, so how close were you to running outside? Because this seemed to be pretty quick. At least from what your account sounded like, it sounded like. Literally, the explosion happened, and then you ran outside. I mean, do you remember how many seconds it was when you heard the explosion and then saw that plane? From the time the explosion hit till I ran outside, it's, like, it's a loading dock, and you can run right out to the lookout and look off. Uh -huh. And then uh, you see the flickering lights uh, inside the area, and then uh, real quick I realized that it was some sort of attack and there was going to be a countermeasure with it. Right. So how many seconds would uh, you guess? Maybe uh, 10 seconds tops. 10 seconds tops? 10 seconds tops. The power impact, I stepped out the little uh, booth that I was in, and the distance between that roof and the edge of that dock is about maybe, I'm like seven steps away from there. Wow. So it was extremely close. You could see that plane just as clear as day. Couldn't miss it. What, what color was it? Do you remember? Uh, it was, to me, at that time, it looked like it was silver in color. Like silver in color. But you saw it over the south parking lot. Right, and it was like banking just above the uh, light poles, like. Okay. And Has it been no more than 
I've been in no more than 50 feet. It was less than 100 feet. Wow. Because okay. it banked out and it was like you turning and coming around and coming out. It looked like, uh, for those brief seconds, it looked like it, it, it um, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, it missed the wrong target and it was going like out of the way, like back to the airport or something like that. Oh, like, so it's headed towards the airport, it looked like. Well, no, not headed towards the airport. It's almost like if, uh, if a pilot misses good, he'll try to do a banking and come around because he missed the target. He missed the landing zone. Got it, got it. And you're, you're, are you 100% sure it was a jet, an actual jet plane? Commercial aircraft. Commercial aircraft, okay. Roosevelt Roberts did not see the plane approach because he was inside the Pentagon at the time of the explosion. He saw it banking and flying away at less than 100 feet, only after running outside immediately after the explosion. This is why he thought it was another plane. Roosevelt could have only seen the same relatively slow banking plane that all the other witnesses reported approaching on the north side flight path. There is additional evidence that more people saw the plane continue past the Pentagon. Arlington National Cemetery employee Eric Deal was officially recorded by the Center for Military History on December 13, 2001. Although he personally did not see the plane, he said the first thing people reported was that a bomb went off and that a jet kept on going. The number of us who were working building 123 right after the explosion was like a double boom, you know, mm -hmm. kind of shook us almost knocked us out of our chairs. We got up and ran outside, and the first few seconds were very confusing. We couldn't even tell. Some people were yelling that a bomb had hit the Pentagon and the jet kept on going. Some people were yelling that a bomb had hit the Pentagon and the jet kept on going. Witness Maria de la Cerda is a military musician who is in Arlington Cemetery and not only supports the north side approach, but she also said that she thought that it struck the, quote, other side. Maria's account was documented by the Center for Military History, February 6, 2002, interview number 567. We confirmed Maria's account with her directly in May 2008. Another interesting thing you said in the interview um, was that you were surprised that the damage was to the side of the Pentagon uh, that you were facing and that you thought it had actually hit on the other side. Yeah, I, my mind's eye, I thought hit on top. On top. And I saw it uh, lift up a little bit. One eyewitness said it appeared that the pilot went to the side of the building, not directly in. Again, the one witness seemed to think that the pilot tried to avert going directly in. My sense of it was not that it was a side impact, but rather that it was on top. My sense of it was not that it was a side impact, but rather that it was on top. Maria did not report the low and level approach depicted by the ASCE, the security video, and required by the physical damage. Now that we've established how the witnesses support a banking north side approach with nothing on the south side, this means the damaged light poles and taxi cab had to have been staged. As unanimously demonstrated by the witnesses, the plane was nowhere near the five down light poles. But it was furthest from light pole number one, 
which is what cab driver Lloyd England claims he lifted out of the windshield of his cab minutes after the attack. Specifications obtained from the Virginia Department of Transportation reveal that this light pole stood 40 feet tall and weighed 247 pounds. Not a single photograph exists showing the pole inside the cab. Not a single witness exists who says they saw the pole inside the cab or the cab driver removing the pole. Most importantly, they all say the plane was nowhere near the light poles. Yet Lloyd claims he came to a stop sideways on the road with the over 30 foot long light pole still sticking out over the hood. and that a silent stranger helped him remove the pole from the car. A car was coming, well, I guess he called it more or less a van, and uh, I asked the guy would he help me get the pole out. So he stopped, he never said a word. I said, man, it's mighty quiet, it's not making, it's so quiet. And uh, he, he never said a word, he helped me get the pole out. The pole happened to be bent when it, when, when we, we pulled the pole out and the pole was bent the, and, and the bent part took me down to the ground. I fell d down on my back, but I held the pole up and uh, laid the pole down and uh, he got in his van and, and went on down the road. This would mean that a 90-ton Boeing traveling 530 miles per hour factored with the kinetic energy of the cab traveling about 40 miles per hour in the opposite direction. Would surely cause at least some damage to the hood of his car. And to clarify, it was the large piece of the base. It's a large, yeah, the large piece that was sticking out across the hood. Wow. The pole came right on through to the back seat. Anybody been sitting in the back, sitting in the front on the right side, the pole would have went through them. Sure. And it, and it actually was laying on your head then? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But there are no scratches on the hood. The sheer weight and length of the pole, in context with the physics of the scenario described by Lloyd, when compared with the total lack of damage to the hood of the cab, reveals a situation that is beyond implausible. But don't forget, the witnesses proved the plane was nowhere near the bridge, light pole number one, or the cab, explaining why this scene is so questionable and beyond physically implausible. Lloyd was confronted with this information in June of 2008 and had a very odd reaction. Before the on-camera interview began, unaware he was being audio recorded, Lloyd let it slip that he knew his cab and the light pole were on the bridge. He took pictures of the event? He was up on the bridge. Mm -hmm. He was up on the bridge. Mm -hmm. He was up on the bridge. Mm -hmm. He took this to the pole. Oh, the pole, right, right. He took this to the car. R right. And uh, as far as I know, he still had it. But when the camera started, Lloyd said the complete opposite and refused to admit he was anywhere near the bridge. So what's up? You know. That's the big question, Lloyd. I mean, you said the government never did anything. Uh, never investigated your cab or took it in for, for, for evidence, right? No, they did not. And I was interviewed by the FBI mm -hmm. once they knew I was still alive because my wife works for them. And she works for the FBI? Yeah, and she said that uh, they were saying that they, uh, they had a problem trying to locate me. She said, well, I see them every day. Here's what's going on, Lloyd. This is we've talked to dozens of people, like I said. No problem. Um, most of them saw the plane for a big long time coming. Right. All these guys, they were at Arlington Cemetery right here in the maintenance buildings. Mm -hmm. We talked to all the people who were at the Sicko station right here. Mm -hmm. um, now, your car, 
well, on the road, on the side of the road, and this picture mm -hmm. was right here. These, no, it wasn't. Yeah, we got pictures of it. Here it is. My car is not there. No, it, we got pictures of it. No, my car was not there. I can pull it up. I'll show you. I don't care what you do. My car was at the Pentagon. My car was not across this bridge. It was on this bridge. I'll show no, you the no, picture. No, no, no. It wasn't. My, my car was back here. It was not down here. This is Columbia Pike. What was it doing here? That's, that's where I was driving. I, I came up off of... I'm coming from Roslyn. And coming from Roslyn, what we, what we call H Road. So where, where are you trying to, to say the, the, the car was here? The car was back here. Okay. Yeah, okay. We, it says, we know that the poles were down here. So you're saying the car was like up here. That's right. After a road trip to go physically examine Lloyd's cab from 9-11 that he had preserved under a tarp 90 miles away on his other property in the country, we were able to show him the images proving his scene with the cab and the pole was just south of the bridge. This picture right here, here you are, you see? The car is kind of surrounded by the, by these guys. There's the pole right here. Now see what this is? That's the cobblestone from the bridge. Now take a look at this. Come over here. Here's the bridge right here. Now there's your cab. It's sideways on the side of the road. With the hole in it, the pole's laying down right over there. The pole used to be up right here. This is pole number one. Well, you're right on the bridge. No. That's your cab, right? Look close. See that? Face the wrong way. No, it's facing the same way. Facing the same way it was right here. This is taken from the other side. This way it's facing. Look at that one. I've never seen that picture there. Before. You never saw it? This is Jason Ingersoll. He was a Navy military photographer. Here's your cab, right? That's not, that's not. That's See your cab? See it? There's the grill. I see you right here. You're wearing the cab. Yeah, I see it. I see it. All right. Now there's the pole. That's your, that's your pole. See the bend? Yeah. That's the pole you pulled out, right? There's your cab. I mean, it couldn't be any other pole. The lamp is down next to it. But see how it's got the cobblestone? I see the sign. That's the sign. But that's that, 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 and that's the cobblestone. That, that's not... Um, from the bridge. That's I, I see that from the bridge, but that's not where it happened. Well, how come you, It's not where it happened. Hmm. Well, how, did they, how did they get there then? I can't explain that. I can... I don't... I've never seen that before. You never saw... I've never seen that. The bridge... Where the plane went across and where the pole came in, there was no bridge. He took this to the pole, he took this to the car. He was up on the bridge. But that's the bridge. That is a bridge, but that's not the bridge. That well, there's only one bridge in the area. I know, but that's not where I was. There's the cab, right? Okay. That's the bridge. Here's the signs. That's not where it happened. What? So what about this image? Is, are you say, suggesting, well, is this your cat? The only thing I can say is where it happened is not, is not on the bridge. This is what I'm not getting. You're saying, like right here, you can see your cat, right? I see a cat, yeah. Well, you see how it's got the hole in there. It's the same cat we just went to go okay. see on your property. Okay. And this is from 9-11. You see it smoking still. And there's the bridge. This is the south of the bridge. That's the sign right there. How far is that smoke fat? I, I don't even care about that. All I know is you're to the south of the bridge. But I'm not. Lloyd continued to refuse to admit that the photographs prove he was located on the bridge. But he already let it slip minutes before the earlier interview started that he knew his neighbor took pictures of his cab and the light pole on the bridge. This proves that Lloyd was deliberately changing his position on the highway for the interview to match up with where all the witnesses saw the plane. We later that night went with Lloyd to obtain the independent photographs from his neighbor, and of course even these images confirmed the same southern position of the cab shown in all other images. Yet Lloyd continued to deny that this is where he was located. Immediately after obtaining the images, we drove to the scene of the crime. I did not uh, come around that way. <clears throat> not down at this bridge. And, uh, he, took the, he was up on the bridge. Mm -hmm. Even the picture your I friend Mike just showed us. I can see. I can see. You see that, right? I can see. How can that be? Well, I'm only telling you what happened. 
You, you're showing, you're telling us something that, that pit, that's completely different from the picture. I have no problem with that. Yeah. Okay, we're on the north side again. You're saying, where were you? I'm saying that... You, you weren't even... Where these signs are right here. Where these signs right here? Right here. These signs right here were where I was at. Right Before right them? Right. North of them? No, this is where the pictures were taken. No, they weren't. There's no cobblestone there. Well, I'm telling you, that that's where I was. There's no cobblestone. That's where I was. This, this is the signs that you see in the images. I understand that, but that's where I was. These are the images, the VDOT pole, the VDOT camera pole, that, all of that. And the cobblestone, look at the cobblestone bridge. That's I, you. I have You're no, standing right next I to it. See no that? I have problem with that. I was not down. See the cobblestone? I was not here. That's where you were. I was not here. Lloyd was much more candid when he didn't realize he was being recorded. You know what his story is? That's what I said. You gotta, you gotta understand what you're saying. That truth is his story. Right. It has nothing to do with the truth. It's his story. This is too big for me, man. It's a big thing. Man, you know, this is, this is a world thing happening. I, I, I'm a small man, you know? Right. My, my lifestyle is completely different from this. Right. I'm not supposed to be involved in this. It's for other people, people who have money and all this kind of stuff. When you said Lloyd, what do you mean? Well, I'm not supposed to be involved in this. I don't have nothing. So is your point that these people that have all the money... This is their thing. This is, this is their event. This, this, is, this is for them. It's Meaning for them. they're doing it for their own reasons, That's right? right? I'm not supposed to be in it. But they used you, right? I'm in it. And you're in it? Yeah, we came, we came across the highway together. You and their event? That's right. But they must have planned that. It was planned. One thing about it, you got to understand something. When people do things and get away with it, you, eventually, it's going to come to me. And when it comes to me, it's going to be so big, I can't do nothing about it. And when it comes to me, it's going to be so big, I can't do nothing about it. So it has to be stopped in the beginning when it's small. Mm -hmm. Steve, keep it from spreading. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Lloyd, in essence, admitted his involvement in the 9-11 black operation but he was cautious not to outright confess. He worked hard to distance himself from the planners, while admitting it was planned. Regardless of Lloyd's true level of involvement, the independent evidence for a north side approach proves the cab and light pole scene staged, and that the plane did not hit the Pentagon. For a thorough analysis of the NTSB-released alleged flight data recorder, exposing fatal anomalies, please see pilotsfor911truth.org. For more Northside Approach witnesses and a comprehensive strategy as to how you can take action on this important information, please visit citizeninvestigationteam.com. What you have just witnessed is conclusive evidence proving that the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon was a carefully planned and skillfully executed military deception. As shown, the evidence proves the plane actually flew directly over the Navy annex and north of the former Sitco gas station and therefore did not hit the light poles or the building. If you still do not understand why the north side approach proves the plane did not hit the building, please watch this video again and study the images. Again. A plane on this flight path cannot hit the light poles, show up low and level across the lawn as seen in the dubious surveillance video, and cause the directional external and internal damage leading to the curiously round C-ring hole outlined in the ASCE building performance report. It is important to understand that, contrary to popular belief, the Pentagon is not located in the restricted airspace in Washington, D.C., but across the Potomac River in Arlington, Virginia. It is also about one mile from Reagan National Airport, so low-flying commercial jets are approaching and departing in the airspace over and near the building every few minutes all day every day. A plane making a steep ascent over the Potomac River is a very common sight. Additionally, fraudulent media reports of a second plane that allegedly shadowed the attack jet 
and veered away at the last moment were disseminated within the first few days of the attack. While there was a C-130 cargo plane that flew into the scene about three minutes after the attack, as confirmed by photographs, video, many eyewitnesses, and the pilot himself, Lieutenant Colonel Steve O'Brien, select media sources falsely reported accounts of this plane, implying and outright stating that it was in the airspace at the same time as the attack. By doing this, the story of a very real second plane seen in the skies minutes later was morphed with the attack in order to later serve as confusion and provide a plausible explanation for the genuine witnesses who really saw the attack jet flying away during the explosion, and not a second plane. This is likely one of the reasons they had the attack jet fly on the north side in the first place. It assured that people who saw the plane flying away just after the fireball could be confidently told that they must have seen a second plane while simply missing AA-77 hitting the building from the south side. It's now clear that this worked wonders as Pentagon police officer Roosevelt Roberts Jr. convinced himself that the plane he saw at about 50 feet altitude flying away immediately after the explosion was another plane. Also worth noting is that light pole number one was the only pole that needed to be staged real time in the street. The other four poles were left lying in the grass, unnoticeable to passing motorists. These poles were more than likely placed the night before. Heliport Tower air traffic controller Sean Boger confirmed that President George W. Bush had conveniently departed from the heliport on September 10th and was scheduled to fly back to the heliport on September 11th around 12 noon and that Secret Service had been combing the area as usual. So operatives under the cover of Secret Service or Special Security conducting routine presidential security operations had the necessary cover to do whatever they needed to do in preparation for the event. When the interviews shown in this presentation were conducted, none of these witnesses were even remotely aware that their accounts contradicted the official flight path and proved that the plane did not hit the building. They were only willing to talk because they were successfully deceived and assumed that the plane must have hit the building. Despite each having a perfect view of the plane as it passed by them at treetop level, most of them were not able to see the alleged impact point or in some cases any part of the Pentagon at all. Many witnesses also described how they were ducking and running for cover before the plane reached the building. Nobody was really trying to look to see if it actually was going to hit the building or not hit the building. So everybody was running in the opposite direction for their lives. Now that they have been made aware of the implications of seeing the plane on the north side, many have been reticent to further discuss their experiences. However, Officer Brooks said our findings were a, quote, eye-opener, and that anything is possible when it comes to him being fooled that day. Officer Legassi admitted that he flinched when he saw the jet and then jumped into his police cruiser, grabbing his radio. The first thing I did was I kind of flinched. Mm -hmm. um, and ducked into my car. And at the time, I mean, I don't know if it was a, a reaction, like a, a fear or whatever, but I ended up in my car. He admitted that he did not see what the plane actually did as it reached the building because of the fireball. Did I see what the plane did? No, because there's a big fireball. Both police officers at the gas station have agreed that we presented their accounts fairly and accurately, and to this day, they stand by where they saw the plane, even after being made aware of the implications. They have both stated they would testify to this under oath in a court of law. Meanwhile, their superiors have restricted them from speaking about their experience on 9-11 to the media any longer. Officer Roosevelt Roberts, who saw the plane flying away from the building after the explosion, was also unaware of the implications until speaking with us. Like many of the other witnesses, he is no longer willing to speak about his experience on 9-11. The fact remains that all of these witnesses can be subpoenaed for a grand jury or congressional hearing as a means to sort out who to indict as responsible for this event, so this is what we are calling for. We know that the implications of the evidence presented in this video are very disturbing and frightening. However, hiding from this information is not an option for any of us. It is now your responsibility to get involved, just as we had a responsibility to get this information into your hands. This deception has been used as a pretext for the invasion and occupation of numerous sovereign nations, leaving thousands of U.S. troops and hundreds of thousands of civilians dead and the lives of millions more destroyed. It has been 
and is still being used to justify torture, secret arrests, warrantless wiretapping, the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, the Real ID Act, and a whole host of other authoritarian programs which undermine the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. The 9-11 lie will continue to threaten peace, freedom, and justice in the United States and around the world as long as the information presented in this video and all the evidence exposing this deception remain suppressed. Inaction to this information by the current administration as the fraudulent war on terror is perpetuated under any other name leaves them not only responsible for the continued bloodshed but implicated in a cover-up and therefore complicit. Furthermore, inaction by any media, political, or authority figures who have viewed this information amounts to a crime of obstruction of justice. But just as importantly, inaction by any of us would be a grave injustice upon our children and grandchildren who will suffer the most in a world that is being created under the fear-mongering false banner of fighting terrorism. We are calling on all concerned citizens to join us in a nonviolent campaign to force accountability, while demanding an immediate and indefinite moratorium to all military action, defense spending, and unconstitutional programs which emanate from the 9-11 deception.